Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session. Um, I'm Phil Charnock. I'm from a company called Draw and Code, and I'm here um, with the support of Invest Liverpool. And we're going to be looking at how immersive technology is driving growth across the Liverpool city region. Um, joining me today, we're going to have Fu Duong, who's from Alderhey Children's Hospital from the Innovation Department, where they're doing incredible work using XR um, actually in live situations in the hospital. We're also going to be talking to National Museums Liverpool. That's the largest museum organisation outside of London. And we're going to be speaking to Fiona Philpott, who's the Director of Exhibitions. And we're going to be speaking to Scott Smith, who is the Head of Digital and who's been getting his head deeply into the world of immersive as the museum industry changes. And we're going to be speaking to Owen Cottrell, the Co-Founder and Creative Director, of Juice Immersive. Juice Immersive is a boutique XR strategic and production agency based here in Liverpool. And we'll be looking a little bit at the company that I represent, Draw and Code. So we're gonna get into it. So spatial and game engine technologies are set to become as useful and ubiquitous as the big name computer operating systems themselves. The Liverpool city region is poised to benefit from this. And this sounds like it's a very big, grand sweeping statement. But only last week it was, uh, I was reading speculation about whether Disney will use Unreal or use their own proprietary game engines in their theme parks. So we're talking about game engines powering theme parks that have millions of visitors per year. This technology is about to appear in all aspects of our lives, just as computer and mobile operating systems do today. Now, when we're thinking about the use of immersive and game engine technology, we like to think about what the Liverpool city region already excels at and what immersive tech can do to help us do those things even better. So one thing that Liverpool is rightly very proud of is its history and medical innovation. Obviously, we're going to speak to Alder Hay, but there's all sorts of other incredible facilities, such as the School of Tropical Medicine. And there's all sorts of big pharma companies represented here in the region. We're going to look at trade events because Liverpool is a stunning, event, a stunning event city. We're very good at events. We're obviously exceptionally good at culture and not only the production of culture, but also its dissemination and sharing it with the world. Film, TV and music, obviously we're certainly a hotspot for those things. Film and TV is really growing as Owen's gonna tell us um, later on. Music, obviously we all know about Liverpool's history in music. And video games and creative technology. If you didn't know, Liverpool has an incredible history in video games. This stretches back to the 1980s, to the Spectrum era, and goes all the way through to today. On top of all those incredible industries, uh, and there's many more, that use immersive technology, we have 169 organisations that utilise immersive technology in the city region, as well as a further 37 assets that are also part of the immersive ecosystem or contribute to it in some way. That includes SciTech Daresbury, it includes Liverpool John Moore's University's um, MTC Centre, the Man Manufacturing Technology Centre, and the University of Liverpool's Virtual Engineering Centre, amongst many other different projects. And when we say these organisations, this isn't just uh, hyperbole, this isn't something that we're just dreaming up off the top of our head. Um, Invest Liverpool commissioned research into finding out exactly what the city region offers in terms of immersive technology. So to go back to me and the company that I'm representing, Draw and Code. So my job is marketing and sales manager, which means that I get to talk about and demonstrate this wonderful technology on a daily basis. And I can tell you that there's never been a better time to be talking about and demoing this technology. It's technology that is moving at such a fast pace and it's such an incredible thing to be part of. So for the last 10 years, we have been working with immersive technology here at Draw and Code. And during that time, we've gone from having to explain what immersive technology is, to explain the terminology, to explain AR, VR, MR, XR, the latter I'm not entirely sure of the definition of myself, if I'm quite honest. Um, but since then, we've seen so many companies, so many organizations, 
both in terms of commercial organizations or in terms of public bodies or in terms of culture, embracing this technology and using it in their own way. No longer do I have to explain what any of this technology does because people already have their own idea of what they want it to do. Um, during this time, we've created over 100 immersive and interactive experiences for global clients. They include all sorts of big names, such as Sony, Philips, Nokia, Hyundai, and Red Bull. And not myself personally, as I definitely don't draw and I don't code, so I think it's fair to say that I'm and. Um, our 20 plus team have even authored two XR focus patents, which is a very exciting thing for us to be innovating in that way. Um, I'm just going to show you just one little case study of not just our, our work at Draw and Code, but this is a case study that's a really good microcosm of what is so good about Liverpool City Region's XR capabilities. So this is Mercedes-Benz Commercial Vehicles Immersive Roadshow. It's something that not only were Draw and Code a part of, but Owen, who will be speaking later, was the lead producer on. Now this project, it had multiple contributors from the Liverpool City Region. Um, it included PR supremos and event organizers, Meat and Potato. It included the aforementioned uh, Juice Immersive with Owen and it included ourselves with Drawing Code. It also included M7 Virtual, who are specialists in 360 photography and film. And there was contributions from Liverpool John Moores University and the nonprofit Make. Um, so it was something that really represented everything we could do in this region. We strategized the whole piece. We brought it all together physically, and it was a very physical thing. This was a roadshow that toured in the back of a Mercedes articulated lorry. So basically, it was a big 18-wheeler that was full of these immersive delights and installations. It included augmented reality, it included mixed reality, which you can see there on the right with the Magic Leap headsets. But when you looked at that physical set, it came to life. It was such a stunningly innovative thing that Magic Leap, the enigmatic mixed reality startup in the US, they actually gave me a call at one point to say, how did you do that? Um, because it was so interesting and innovative and a really great way to tell the story of what Mercedes were trying to do with electrification and smart vehicles. And there was also a virtual reality component that put you behind the wheel and literally in the seat of a Mercedes vehicle as it was motion platform VR. So that meant that the motion platform moved the seat according to where the, the vehicle was going in the film. So it was something that was truly immersive. Literally your bum was even being moved by it, not just your mind. It was something that was quite incredible. And the fact that it was all delivered within the city region is something we're really proud of. And I think it is a really neat representation of what this region can do. We're great storytellers, we're great thinkers, we're great doers. Um, speaking of people who are exceptionally good at what they do, I would like to introduce to you Fu Duong, who is a paediatric cardiology consultant at Alder Hay Children's Hospital. Fu, can you take it away, please? Thank you, Phil, for the kind introduction. And thank you, the organizers, for this opportunity to um, let me share some of the uh, unique experience that we have uh, been experienced at Alder Hay Children of late. Can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, yes, so Older Hay is um, what you wonder as to what uh, actually a hospital has got to play with this in the nice digital technology conference. Uh, in fact, I'm actually, as a, as a recent member of Older Hay, I'm actually really proud to, to say that uh, this is an excellent hospital. Um, it's unique in many senses that um, is part of the, uh, the city of Liverpool region strategic development, um, where it's situated, as you see, that's the plan on the uh, west of Liverpool, um, east of Liverpool, um, that side where the hospital is um, designed by children and is part of the multi-million um, pound development where it is a centre for excellence of child health development, research and innovation. Um, and what's unique about uh, this hospital even furthermore compared to many other NHS organisations is that um, it, in the centre of it is the innovation centre. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Yeah. So it is a very, very busy, um, productive hub um, of interaction between patients and staff and multiple partners uh, that uh, are part of this uh, this uh, this um, organisation uh, within the bigger NHS organisation. 
uh, where it facilitates multiple activities and promotes innovation, uh, collaboration between industries. And within this, uh, we have um, a center for rapid prototyping, uh, investment into artificial intelligence, immersive technology, sensors, and so on. Um, and um, what's not to say about uh, uh, the, 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 the impacts of COVID have on all of us. Um, as we all learned, it's an opportunity for us to rethink and, uh, and re-evaluate our uh, current uh, progression and as to where we were taken on forward. As COVID hit, we were literally taken away from all our luxuries of um, delivering our services uh, by we could not communicate to each other by face to face. We cannot see our patients as readily as we like to do. Uh, and we cannot um, share some of the emotions that we, we sometimes needed to do to alleviate the pain of these parents or the children. And um, having said that, we ought to find a way to innovate and uh, deliver this. Um, and uh, there's no options to go around it because any delay, any uh, impacts caused by this, um, this pandemic has already, already been bad enough um, and therefore the technology should be there to help us um, do our job better. And here um, I would like to share one of the few use cases that we developed uh, within the, uh, the hospital. Okay, the next slide please. As you know, communication is, is an integral part of the service. We're used to seeing each other, we're used to exchange expertise, we're used to uh, pick each other's brain and to coming up with the treatment and development. And that's a completely out of the picture with COVID. Um, and within that context, uh, we have to innovate. And so thankfully, uh, within um, our innovation uh, center, we will have the ability to uh, quickly adapt and um, equip ourselves with the mixed reality device. Uh, here you see our director of innovation center, Mr. Rafael Guerrero there, using uh, the uh, HoloLens 2, the second generation uh, mixed reality device uh, to communicate with uh, the rest of the team. Next slide, please. Um, there you see that um, there's a picture of uh, uh, one of uh, the operator of the HoloLens. In this case, I was uh, uh, testing it out um, and uh, we were doing a complex assessment uh, to help uh, decide, decide treatment on the baby in intensive care unit. And on the picture on the right hand side, you see uh, the, uh, the members of the team, in this case, the surgeons or anyone else in the, in the discussion can be part of that um, complex decision making process. And, um, you know, we were able to do all this uh, within the most difficult part of time. Next slide, please. Can we have the next uh, slide, please? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, there comes that I would like to play the video next. Is the and this here um, is it, just um, the illustration of uh, how it's, it's operating in practice. This is in the middle of COVID, uh, where we had um, the patient being operated on, and uh, the, the surgeons operating, and. Uh, not obviously sometimes uh, we try to um, mitigate risks by uh, warning the surgeon as much as possible about the potential uh, challenges or difficulties or they, so they can then plan about the strategy of the operation but things sometimes doesn't go quite as planned um, and in this case here there was a, uh, an unusual findings which whereas it has to um, be discussed with other members of the team and in this case um, I was uh, deploying the HoloLens there and then we were initiating a telephone call with multiple members of the team and uh, the conversation is then uh, initiated where Mr. Guerrero um, was then able to communicate with uh, the other doctors and myself and there you see that's a view from the um, inside the HoloLens where uh, the other members of the team can actually see what's in front of us and what the problems are and we can then plan the alternative plan. But that's just the, the few idea of, uh, of how we uh, deploy this technology in practice. And uh, I would like to move on to the next slide. Um, so then what's next? Uh, we would like to um, uh, benefit the region uh, by uh, helping the other uh, hospitals that we have uh, patients in and we are supporting uh, the services. Um, 
in this case, we are looking after children within an area of uh, 9 to 10 million people population, which is a very, very large area within the country. Uh, many of our physicians and doctors uh, are not um, uh, not that, that because they're not uh, an experience, but uh, sometimes they just need that extra bit of help. And what's better than having uh, the benefits of the specialists in uh, the central hospitals being there to help support them, uh, making good decisions and empower them, uh, making uh, their life uh, better, also the benefits of their patients. Uh, and then we are uh, planning to deploy this into the environment of virtual clinics, emergency services, uh, and then uh, promote some um, education material um, and um, also the uh, enrolling it into the community services. Can you have the next slide, please? Yeah. So. So um, yes, yeah, so that's just a, a brief example of uh, some of the few use cases um, that we have at Order Hay. Um, the uh, aim of uh, of the hospital and the, uh, the management board is that we are developing a common hub where we attract as many partners as much as possible uh, where uh, the technologies can be interchanged um, and then we can develop some, some common products and innovate and uh, uh, further on we will have some meaningful product produce uh, and uh, to benefit the, the patients within our region and so on. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Fu. Uh, I was just going to ask just one or two questions. Um, it, it's quite incredible the work that is um, happening in Alder Hayes Innovation Hub. I've been lucky enough to visit there a couple of times and it's, it's the most stunning facility. Um, in terms of when you're taking this new technology and you're, you're using something like a Microsoft HoloLens 2, a device that's only been out for the last year or two, is it really kind of tough to kind of take something that's that's such relatively new technology and to actually use it in a live environment like that? Is the kind of red tape you have to go through or are you the ones writing the rules in this case? Um, actually, yes. Yeah, I, thank you for asking this question. Uh, very, very um, uh, good question. Uh, we are um, we appreciate it is a, a new technology. Um, and um, it obviously it does have its uh, shortcomings and, and benefits. Uh, but in, we were in the situation where we will have to remember that COVID has taken away a lot of uh, luxury from our daily practice and we didn't have uh, a lot of other alternative choices. Uh, so we then started out using it as the uh, test uh, devices and uh, test of fidelity and also the ability to communicate and, uh, and obviously uh, arising in there, we uh, anticipated a lot of uh, circumstances where we would need it to um, be careful as to what um, what would we would have done on the other um, uh, circumstance to ensure that the safety and um, benefits to our patients is the utmost important um, achieve, um, uh, goal that we need to achieve. Um, so within that process, and, and I mean, it's been going on for over a year now, uh, and we were quite lucky to start uh, deploying it from the early days, and we ahead of some of the other places in the country uh, where uh, we are able to uh, think about uh, what is the structure that we need to develop. And with some from that journey, we're then able to communicate with um, some of our um, other uh, sites and universities um, and um, other places uh, with a different setting, things like, you know, more places where they're more towards community services or some places are a bit more remote. Uh, so, yeah, within that whole journey, we are able to develop some governance structure, guidance, um, um, SOPs and also uh, we're working with uh, Health Education England in towards uh, developing some guidelines around this as well. Obviously you've been working with, uh, I told how you've been working with what we'll refer to as maybe spatial technologies, kind of 3D, you know there's been incredible progress with 3D printing, um, literally scans that basically have come from individuals, patients in the hospital, and being able to literally physically replicate, uh, you know, either parts of their body or, or whatever it might be. So you can look over it in a totally new way of seeing everything. So this is, you know, something that's this something you've been working on for a long time, but do you feel like the rapid response that has been necessary, obviously by, by everybody, but particularly by the NHS, to COVID, do you think that that kind of, uh, you know, to a degree opens a door to yourselves to, to kind of accelerate what you're doing and the implementation of what you've been already doing for a long time, but to actually put that into practice even quicker than you would have done? 
that's definitely uh, completely true in, in this context. Um, in the past, in order to evaluate a technology, it, we need to go through a lot more red tapes than usual. Uh, whereas now, if we already have um, the infrastructure, the Wi-Fi, the, uh, the investment in towards the, the technology, everyone has got a fast computer um, and uh, there's clear focus on to um, uh, developing content which are more beneficial for education in different ways and also to make use of the device as well because it's not just a telemedicine um, communication device but itself is a, 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 a true mixed reality um, uh, computer uh, so we can then uh, develop a lot more meaningful content uh, and um, elevate the way education is delivered um, at, the, at the moment. Um, and we not, we actually already started trying out a few uh, smaller projects, and that's uh, early stage at present. Um, so it is is a very exciting time ahead. Do you believe that one day we will look at something like a Hololens? It may not be a Hololens, but something of that ilk will basically be standard issue to a surgeon or a doctor. What do you think that is where we're heading towards? Uh, yes, um, I. I um, I, I see technology as uh, as an, a tool, as a very useful tool for us to, to help me do my job and my colleagues to do their jobs. Um, there's a lot of it. Um, we we cannot um, replace traditional um, education methods for medicine, especially is more like a, an apprenticeship and a vocation, rather than you know you can't just um, sit at home and learn all these things virtually. You've got to have um, contact with patients, um, and you've got to have to develop good communication skills. Or with each other and also with the patients. Um, so, um, but definitely within that um, that uh, that leaping aspects of the education and training side of things, it definitely provides um, tools that has never been delivered before. Uh, I remember when I went to university, there's a lot of things that um, are not accessible to uh, the whole year of. of, of uh, medical students, 300 and 400 students, one cannot expect them to, every single student to rotate through the same rotation and see the same specimen um, throughout. Uh, but these are uh, the tools which will allow them to have access to it. And it's not just one example or two example, but a whole library, the whole archive of uh, complex um, uh, conditions and uh, scenarios, if you like. Uh, so it's all up to us to develop some of those content at present. Um, so yeah, so the, the future is going to be very exciting for medical education as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to introduce um, Fiona Philpot and Scott Smith from National Museums Liverpool, who are going to talk about how technology is influencing their world and the world of museums. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Hello, thanks. Thanks very much. Well, as Phil mentioned earlier, we work for National Museums Liverpool and we're, we're the largest cultural organisation in the region. We're the only national museum group in England outside of London. And we have four million items in our collections which cover art, history and science. So we're a jolly large organisation. And we're going to tell you about what we've been up to during lockdown. So over the last 12 months, things have been really challenging for us. Our venues have been closed for months and when we've been open, visitor numbers have been really restricted. So like many organisations, we've been keen to stay in touch with our, um, our, our visitors and our supporters. And this has led to a huge increase in online activity, which in turn has resulted some, in some amazing innovation. So we found new ways to offer experiences and engagement and in some instances to generate revenue. We've been able to offer our visitors virtual tours of both of our exhibitions and our collections from the comfort of their homes. Some museums have streamlined opening events, as we had done, talks and performances, and we produce virtual classroom sessions and all sorts of resources for home learning. We've been churning out games and quizzes and so on. And really, um, the activity that we've been involved with has really has accelerated our digital transformation as an organisation. So we've been far, far busier on a digital front than we ever expected to be. And we've introduced um, a po podcast series, which is ho hosted by Jane Garvey from the BBC, which has taken a, um, a really interesting look at our collections. And we've been telling stories and exploring them in the context of the present day. 
We've also um, been engaging with with a worldwide audience. So people who can't necessarily get to Liverpool or get to our collections have been able to engage with us um, in, in the United States. There's a lot of interest in the International Slavery Museum. So we've engaged with new visitors um, for, for the first time. And of course, digital platforms are fantastic, but um, what they don't do is um, replicate or replace the the um, the excitement of um, being actually in in a venue with with collections and and seeing having the thrill of seeing original artifacts and also the social interaction that comes with all of this as well so we we know from experience that digital technology can actually completely transform form the visitor experience within our venues, within our museums and galleries. And we saw this actually back in 2018 with Terracotta Warriors. And um, when we staged that exhibition, what we wanted to do was make it really special and memorable. There have been loads of exhibitions on Terracotta Warriors over the years, but we wanted ours to be something really special. And we were delighted when Draw and Code, in partnership with Adlib, both local companies, won the commission. And it was a combination of their creative vision and their technical wizardry that set them apart from other competitors. And the collaboration helped us to tell a unique and compelling story and to interpret the, the warriors in a very different way. We were able to take visitors back in time using a combination of projected AR and hand-drawn animation and VR visualization, immersive sound and audio tracks and special effects. So effectively, Effectively, we use 21st century technology to tell a 2000 year old story. So visitors experienced the sights and the sounds of warfare. They encountered the expansiveness of the emperor's burial site. And for a moment, they glimpsed the magic of the emperor's burial chamber as well. So this use of theater with traditional museum exhibits really inspired us and has influenced some of the, the ways in which we are now working. And it's something that visitors have a real appetite for. They want experiences. They want something new, something unexpected, and something a little different from the more traditional approach that we've used for, for many years. So another project that we're working on at the moment at World Museum has been inspired by Sarah Howe, who was writer in residence on the Tide project at Liverpool University in 2018. And what we've done in the World Cultures Gallery at World Museum is to create a new installation where visitors will hear the, the imaginary voices of Chinese ceramics. So they, they, they hear their stories about their experiences of being on a potter's wheel, their journey across thousands of miles and across continents, their feelings of homesickness and, and shipwreck. And this narrative is delivered in the form of poetry and it's been accompanied by, by atmospheric, mysterious and exotic animations which are projected around the walls from floor to ceiling in the gallery. And this is linked to a soundscape. And this approach offers visitors a completely different experience. It's one that stimulates the senses, it inspires different thoughts. It helps us see, th see things from a completely alternative perspective. It opens the mind to new ideas and, and possibilities. And then another project we're working on is in partnership with the Nottingham based artist Wolfgang Buttress. And this is a landmark exhibition which is exploring the evolution, the adaptation and the survival of bees and the role that they play and, and the importance they have to the very survival of our planet. And this, in this instance, we're using technology to, to create an immersive and sensory experience for visitors, which includes the use of algorithms to transmit the activity and, and the sound of bees from the hive into the exhibition space in real time. And it's been developed through collaboration with the museum specialists, with scientists, with film and light and sound engineers, as well as fabricators. And it's designed to help visitors see and experience nature through completely different eyes, creating something which is both educational and experiential often um, allows us to, to, to um, uh, change um, our, our, our ideas about things and, and, and um, can influence us in completely unexpected ways. So now I'm going to hand over to Scott, who's going to talk to you about some of the other projects we're working on at the moment. 
Hello, everyone. So, yeah, I'm just going to talk about a couple of the really, really exciting projects we have coming up at National Museums Liverpool that are using immersive tech. So following on from the success of the Terracotta Warriors exhibition in 2018, we're once again going to be working with Draw and Code on a project titled The Enchanted Museum. So the Enchanted Museum will be a large scale immersive theatrical experience hosted at World Museum. And we really want to make this one of the most innovative and exciting museum experiences ever seen. And over the last few months, we've been working on an R&D program that's involved creative workshops, um, site visits to our museum stores and detailed discussions with curators and also public consultations. The experience itself is inspired by Studio Ghibli and Spirited Away, Bill and Ted, Night at the Museum and HG Wells, just to name a few. And what we really want to do is tip the museum world and the experience on its head. So visitors will interact with performers, engage with theatrical sets and projections and other immersive XR technologies that you know, allow visitors to travel through the depths of the earth, see through walls, find treasures and uncover lost stories, all with amazing lighting and soundtracks. So a bit like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, our visitors will be able to peek behind the curtain and get a glimpse of the inner workings of the museum and visitors will become members of staff who will start their first day at the museum and moving through the experience they'll feel like they're living the story themselves as it unravels blending both fantasy and reality um, this project is still in the very early stages but that it's one that we really hope to excite our visitors with in the near future um, so the next thing i want to talk about is our house of memories on the road project so House of Memories is a program that's aimed at supporting people living with dementia, as well as their families and carers. And it's been a highly successful program, winning a num number of awards and gaining high level political support. Um, My House of Memories is a digital memory resource for iPads and other tablets. And it's the first of its kind anywhere in the world. And the project itself was co-created by a dedicated team at National Museums of Liverpool and people living with dementia. So when a person downloads the app, they can access a wide range of content and it allows people to browse objects from across decades uh, brought to life with music and film to prompt discussion and reminiscence about everyday memories and events. Uh, the app is supported by the NHS in the UK and it's now being used across the world, having launched in the USA and most recently in Singapore. But what the team wanted to do was to go one further than this. And we've been working on a project called House of, Memory on, House of Memories on the Road which will utilize immersive tech um, in a unique solution offered by Alpha Dropbox and Immersive Interactive. Our aim is to develop a new community outreach resource, which will increase our reach and enable us to connect more directly with isolated older people and those living with dementia in a more hands-on sensory way. And then the final thing I wanted to mention today is a project that's uh, a fun project, <laughs> which is all about play and it's a concept called Mission Kronos. So the idea behind Mission Kronos is that it will be a web AR audio based game that takes place at World Museum. So players will have to quest around the museum, interacting with our objects and galleries to find clues in order to progress the mystery and save the world. Uh, so partnering once again with Draw and Code will use cutting edge tech to engage new audiences at the museum, particularly targeting young people and teenagers. So the player will become a hero that's been drafted in to solve the mystery at World Museum and they'll start their experience inside and the audio and AR elements will place them in this magical realist world that they're questing in. Uh, the experience will take the players around the physical space of the museum and involve puzzle solving quests that will be prompted by audio. So it will use web AR tech and once at the correct location, the game will use AR in order to augment the player experience uh, using audio clips recorded by voice actors. So think escape room, meets the museum packaged into an exciting audio quest. Uh, we're aiming to launch this game later in 2021, so, so do keep an eye out for it. Um, I'm gonna hand back over to Fiona, no, it's me. So yeah, like we said, we've got really huge ambition and there's no shortage of creative talent and innovation as this panel's already shown, um, but the barrier is sometimes cost and we're in, one of the things we have to think about at the museum is how we raise the capital investment to deliver these mind-blowing digital experiences uh, which do have the potential to drive tourism within the sector and within the region so th that's all from us for now 
Thank you very much. That was that was a thrill for me because um, the Enchanted Museum there, we've yet to reveal that to the world. We've revealed the research behind it, but that's your first glimpse of what the kind of brand and the creative concept will be for that incredible experience. And just quickly, just, just before we go on to Owen, I, I just want to just ask about with kind of, you know, what, what you were talking about at the beginning with the various kind of virtual tours and virtual uh, exhibition launches, is this something you see continuing? This isn't a COVID only solution, maybe. Is this something you will expect to offer with any kind of in venue events and exhibitions in the future? Um, yes, is the short answer, absolutely. So, as Fiona said, our digital transformation not only um, amplified it, propelled us at rocket speed during the pandemic. And I think everyone internally has been really behind us with this and really seen the value of what digital can offer us as an organization. And um, with, especially with the virtual tours, we've seen the impact and the reach that they've had, um, specifically, as Fiona mentioned, with the International Slavery Museum. So there's a lot of interest um, in the United States uh, around the International Slavery Museum. And we've, we've had you know emails from people that it's allowed them to visit when they potentially never would have been able to and engage with all of that amazing content and all of those stories that are in the museum. And equally, you know, we had with our dinosaur virtual tour, for example, emails from grandparents who used to take their grandkids every Sunday and now they've been doing it virtually. So I think it just offers an alternative to the norm. And yeah, we're really keen to keep that up. That's, that sounds like a, a very good thing to be doing during lockdown indeed. Um, thank you very much to Fiona and Scott. Now we're going to speak to Owen Cottrell um, from Juice Immersive. Owen, over to you. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, if uh, you could do me the honour of shifting slides for us. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Owen Cottrell. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the creative director of Juice Immersive, as Phil introduced me earlier. Um, I'm a graduate of um, a media production course that ran at LJMU in the um, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, it was a Phil Redmond endorsed um, media production course, so extremely industry focused so it was filmmaking uh, and my aspiration to do that that brought me to Liverpool in the first place uh, back in 97 from down south um, and off the back of that course I co-founded um, a video production agency called Mocha uh, that still exists today uh, it's now in its 21st successful year uh, and I worked as a producer and director for that business on, on hundreds if not thousands of video production projects over 18 years uh, when I was there um, I've worked on projects uh, for the organisations represented on the panel today over that time as well. Um, and the vast majority of, of our work was shot here in the Liverpool city region. Uh, so I know I know what filmmaking is in this part of the world, um, albeit a lot of our work was more on the commercial and corporate side. Um, more recently, I've moved into the immersive industry, as Phil alluded to earlier. So uh, I co-founded Juice Immersive with my business partner, Gareth Abbott, um, two years ago now. And our first major piece of work was the Mercedes-Benz uh, Vans project that Phil talked about earlier, the Immersive Roadshow piece. And so Juice has been set up as, a, as an XR specialist consultancy and production agency. Um, but in terms of my career path, that has exclusively taken place here in Liverpool. I've never left uh, this wonderful city and it's taken me through the world of traditional filmmaking and now on into immersive and XR storytelling. So that's that's kind of a little bit about my journey. Um, Phil, are we able to move on to the slides? Great, thank you. Um, so Liverpool has always been a, a filming city with a proud and rich heritage, and that dates all the way back to when the, the pioneering Lumiere brothers filmed their amazing footage uh, of the docks here from the overhead railway back in 1896, which at the time was a hugely innovative piece of film. And um, if you could skip us on a slide, please, Phil. So whether it's doubling as London or New York, and one more slide please Phil, or hosting period dramas uh, that take us back in time, this city has always enjoyed an embarrassment of riches when it comes to locations. And it is that diverse range of locations that has attracted filmmakers from across the globe to come to this city uh, over the years. Um, one more slide please Phil. The, the Liverpool has, um, always enjoyed visiting productions. That's been the sort of bedrock really of its filmmaking economy. Um, and just a quick thank you to, to Lynn Saunders and the team at the Liverpool Film Office for, for some insight they've given me, some up-to-date facts and figures uh, over the last few days. 
Um, at the start of 2020, Liverpool had a hundred million pounds worth of production scheduled to take place over the following year in the city, which represented by far the, the biggest year that it was going to have in terms of filmmaking. Then obviously the, the pandemic hit and it hit that really, really hard. Uh, but something incredibly interesting has happened since. Um, filmmaking was one of the industries um, that, that became unlocked first. It was given um, permission to, to begin work again under, under obviously strict COVID guidelines. Um, and the Liverpool Film Office has since seen, so probably from June onwards, has, has seen an explosion in activity again. But there's been quite a subtle difference in the type of filmmaking that uh, perhaps has been taking place since uh, the restart, if you like. Um, if you could skip us on a slide, please, Phil. The, the, a lot of the work now taking place in the city, um, whereas traditionally that might have been represented by major feature film activity, now it's being driven more by high-end TV production, um, by some of the big streaming platforms, the Netflixes of this, of this world. Um, so a good example of that is the Irregulars, as you can see on screen here. That's a, a Netflix series that's, um, that's just launched now. So Liverpool is now experiencing its busiest period for film and TV production on record. Uh, we're, we're busier than ever we've been before in this city, uh, as, as anyone who walks the streets will, will be able to testify. Um, you, you, you barely walk around a corner often without seeing a film crew busily working away in the city. Um, a big part of that is the LCR production fund. Um, Liverpool has invested uh, two million pounds into six high-end TV series um, over the last year or so. And that two million then turned into 12 million pounds that was spent locally by those productions, both on Liverpool-based crew, um, but also on, on the wider infrastructure and hospitality and everything else that goes with film production and TV production. Um, from a talent perspective, the series I referred to before, The Irregulars, um, they actually took a number of trainees, uh, young talent from places like Liverpool Media Academy, into paid roles on that production. Trainees actually went on from working on The Irregulars to working on um, the new Batman film, uh, working title Vengeance, that took place in the city more recently as well. So. Um, so the, the production fund and Liverpool Film Office more widely has been integral to the growth of the filmmaking economy in this city. And the Film Office was actually the first film office of its kind uh, set up in Europe uh, and has been responsible for the huge spike in, in, uh, in activity that takes place here. And one, one other thing that uh, the Film Office have seen recently is a spike in inquiries from post-production houses looking at Liverpool seriously now as a destination. So we're, we're becoming a city that's not just a landing place for, for, for the locations that we have to offer and, and the production side of the business. It's also somewhere people are looking to actually complete work and do all the post-production on their, on their productions as well. So, um, which leads us on to a little bit about the new studios project. Um, the British Film Institute acknowledge, as does the wider industry, that we need approximately a million square foot of new studio space in the UK and we need that now. That is current demand that the uh, high-end TV and film industry have. Um, it's actually driven more by high-end television than it is by traditional features. Um, the exciting Littlewood studio development you see on screen there um, is something that we have on the horizon in Liverpool uh, and is something extremely exciting. But as I said, that demand for, for new studio space is now. It's not in the future and it's an acute demand. Um, and a lot of the other main studios, those down in the southeast, the Pinewoods and Shepperton's of this world are already expanding their offer um, to try and meet that demand. Um, but the levelling up agenda and government support uh, for Liverpool has actually meant that we've been able to uh, activate the depot, which is the pop-up film studios that are going to appear very, very soon down on Edge Lane. Uh, and that's a way we can start to, to meet some of that demand and get some of that post-production and production action into the city. Um, before the Littlewoods studios more widely are developed over the next few years. So the, the two 20,000 square foot sound stages that the, the depot represent um, should be coming online in, in June and effectively have, have advanced a, a latter stage of the Littlewoods development and brought, brought it forward so that we can actually start capitalising on that demand as of, as of right now. Um, what does it bring? The depot alone is set to bring £24 million of economic boost to the regional economy. 
360 new jobs and 760 indirect jobs as well. Um, and the two anchor tenants that have been announced, Twickenham Film Studios and LJMU, uh, are major, major coups for the for the um, studios. And also it will be a potential home for those high end streaming services such as Netflix over the next few years. A major element of this is connectivity. So the slide on screen now represents the the game changer, really, that is the digitally connected initiative that uh, the Liverpool City Region has recently announced. Um, the the ability to send high volumes of data around the world from the Edge Lane Studios and from locations around the city region will essentially connect our area up to the world in a way it's never been before. And I think will be a major differentiator for this part of the world against some of those competing parts of the UK uh, for filmmaking. And it will, it will support our drive to become the 24-7 film city that we want to be. So just finally, I'll talk a bit about how XR and immersive is starting to be used in filmmaking. It's not really that new uh, is the first point I think I'd make. So um, I first experienced uh, an immersive um, piece of, of, of content, I suppose, back uh, a few years back now when Fox released the 24 Legacy VR prequel. Um, 24 was a series I'd, I'd grown up with and was, was massively into and very excited about this new spin-off series. Uh, and I, I went into this VR experience called The Raid, where you were thrown right into the middle of the of the explosive action. Um, and it, it just made me appreciate at that point, before I was even working in this space, just how incredibly mind blowing a, a really well produced immersive experience can be and how close it can bring you to the action that you love. So. Um, so XR has been playing a role in storytelling and in bonus features and, and behind the scenes type um, type activity for a number of years already. Um, but the point I really wanted to sort of get across was how it's actually starting to enable and impact the production process itself now. Um, so uh, on screen at the moment and the next couple of slides as well represent The Mandalorian, uh, the Disney Plus Star Wars spin-off, um, who I think are probably the best example and most most ambitious example of, uh, of a production that's, that's taking immersive technology to a level of action. Um, they used massive immersive LED walls on their LA soundstage, combined with virtual location backdrops that have been produced during pre-production. Um, and just to, to the point Phil made before about, about games engines, this, this was all um, driven by powerful PCs running the games engine Unreal. And what it enabled was that um, operators could simultaneously manipulate the virtual location backdrop on the LED screens in real time um, so that it was as if the camera was actually in those locations. So as the camera moved on set, the backgrounds could be moved in sync with that. Um, recreating exactly what it would look like if the uh, if the scene was being shot in that virtual location. Um, next slide, please, Phil. Just finally, one one other example uh, closer to home than LA, obviously, of how uh, XR has supported and is supporting the film industry now. Um, obviously, we we always need to be careful uh, about naming naming major major studios and major projects, but. A few months ago in this city, a certain Cape Crusader started appearing on our city streets and on our buildings. Um, and this this feature film had been had been dogged with delays due to COVID. Um, it, it was just in the eye of the storm in terms of when its when its production schedule was. Um, but when it did get back up and running again, one of the major challenges it had was how it could actually operate under the new COVID restrictions and the travel restrictions that were in place. Um, a partner company of ours that worked with us uh, on the Mercedes project, a company called M7 Virtual, um, actually came up with an incredible solution to the problems that productions like Batman were facing. Um, and what they enabled was a 360 video stream from set. So uh, they installed cameras onto the main camera rigs on set. And what that enabled was people who were unable to actually travel to Liverpool to be on location or indeed to Leaveston down south when, when the shooting was happening down there. It enabled them to, to remotely dial in to the set to see a full 360 view from various different camera positions and actually influence what was going on on set. Um, and also the other the other element to that was even some of the top level crew, so the directors and the DOPs, 
rather than having to repeatedly walk onto set and off again to necessarily direct talent or direct lighting technicians, they were able to remain safely and distantly sat in the video village offset, but with their 360 degree view of what was going on, and they were able to direct talent from that remote vantage point. So it really managed to limit the amount of human traffic that was having to, to walk in and out of set the whole time. So uh, I think that's just such a beautiful example of a, of a homegrown use of XR being utilized by what is arguably the biggest production company in the world in Warner Brothers. So um, fantastic solution and, and just a great example, I think. And that, that same basic use of XR technology is now being used for things like remote location scouting and that kind of thing, uh, situational awareness training, that sort of that sort of activity. So um, just, to, just to finally summarize, I think where LCR has established itself as a filmmaking destination, we're now also bringing our immersive community skill sets to the table and helping realize Liverpool's ambition to truly become a 24-7 film city. Thank you, Phil. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, it is such a thrill to see the city on screen, isn't it? And it is incredible to see LCR-based innovation actually in action on a major blockbuster such as The Batman. And um, just quickly, just before we wrap up, I was just going to ask you, Owen, in terms of obviously what you were looking at with the uh, that 24 legacy was very much about immersive delivery, about kind of being in a 360 world. What we're looking at with something like the Batman or Mandalorian is using immersive techniques in the pipeline production of the piece, whereas uh, then it will be delivered in a conventional way. Uh, is it something where... At the moment, will those two areas, do you think they'll stay separate for a little while or are we on the verge of completely immersive movies with some of the kind of immerse, immersion and interaction you would expect from virtual reality and the like? I think they'll, I think they'll converge ultimately. I think they already are starting to. Um, when I think back to the different sort of waves of, of innovation that, that happened um, for me when I first entered, entered the, the, the video industry, uh, it was the it was the digital digitization of that of that world that enabled me really to leave university and, and start up a production company the next, and I, and I just see it as as the next wave of technology. And I think it it stands to reason that the thing it did first was provide an alternative form of storytelling um, in you know truly immersive experiences, allowing us fans to get closer to our to our heroes and to the action, um, but. But like you said, and like the, like the examples on, on the presentation show, we are now also able to, to impact the production process itself. And I think that, that those boundaries will ultimately blur. Um, I mean, we're all, we're all filmmakers now every day on our, on our devices that, that we carry around in our pockets. And we can, now, we can now put 360 imagery up on Facebook. We can do all of these things that, that a few years ago would, would have seemed quite out just just so far into the future and 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 again i think the year that we had in 2020 has just accelerated a lot of that so so yeah no i, I think i think they will converge and and do so beautifully as well i think um the, the 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 tech that is here now is here to stay and and people are starting to really embrace it the film industry has always embraced new technology You'll have certain people and practitioners who are maybe a bit more old school and a bit slower to, to, to readily adopt, but you've got an awful lot of filmmakers who are who are coming through, who are young talent, who are just ready to start bringing this stuff um, to their field. So, so yeah, really exciting few years ahead. And just just a quick question to to everybody really. So we've heard um, about how immersive technology is working in the Liverpool city region, and we've had examples from health, we've had examples from culture and from the crossover between filmmaking and XR. Um, what are the other kind of, if anybody wants to just stick their hand up and answer, what, what other areas do you think Liverpool is well set up for in terms of, uh, you know, a sector that it works in that will work well with XR and it's kind of, it's, you know, growing XR ecosystem? I think, I think one, one really good example is manufacturing and you mentioned um, like the manufacturing technology center earlier, Phil, and, and we've got, um, 
we've got a strong kind of footprint in this area in in manufacturing which can't be said i think of, of a lot of parts of the uk nowadays um and actually xr is is hugely relevant to manufacturing it, it's going to be an enabler of of new processes it's going to be the the key to massive savings and efficiencies training health and safety there's so many different applications for xr technology in manufacturing um, so, and that's just one example, but I think it's it's one that is pertinent to the Liverpool City region because of the of the wealth of manufacturing knowledge and and uh, innovation that we have here. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to end on that that positive note. Um, so thank you very much to everybody for tuning in. Um, thank you to our panel, to Fu, to Fiona to Scott and to Owen. Um, I'm Phil Charnock and this is the LCR Immersive Ecosystem at Play. And thank you very much to everybody for tuning in. Thank you. Goodbye.